Stop it. Some of us would have experienced it. Some might be experiencing it. So we have to be very careful. And I trust that the Lord will help us. Praise God. Have you got your Bible? And your right to material. The title is Trauma Triggers and the Lord. Traumas Triggers and the Lord. Let me start by asking Has anyone ever experienced a traumatic situation? I have my reason for asking. You don't have to answer. But you see, over the years, what I've learned is people go through a lot. And sometimes we don't know how to deal with these things. Because we are relational beings, so we have to relate to one another. And in most cases, the relationships are cordial. They are good. Sadly, in some other cases, they don't work well. And you see, as Christians, the Bible teaches us how to respond. The Bible tells us if you've been offended, traumatized, in whatever shape or form, the Bible teaches to forgive. Now, if you study the scripture very well, you will find out that the Bible doesn't actually comment on what's been done to you. Whether or not the person did something very bad, whether it's just a minor offense, it doesn't really matter. All the Bible says is to forgive. Whether or not the deep, uh, the, the wound is so deep or just a surface wound, doesn't really matter. And I believe that over the years, many of us are walking in forgiveness and trying as best possible to forgive. But you see, that's one aspect. Because as soon as you forgive, you realize that forgiveness does not take away the effects of what has happened. For some people, it might be almost immediate, but in most cases, it takes a while. And that's why the Bible encourages us to be careful about the root of bitterness. And today, I want us to talk about traumas, triggers. And the Lord's. Let's open our Bible to the book of First Peter, chapter number five. First Peter, chapter number five. Are we there? He says, likewise. You younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, 
Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. Now verse 7 says, casting all your care upon him. For he cares for you. You see, when we go through difficult situations, when we are faced with challenging situations, whether or not we've had a traumatic event, for some people it's something that happened in the past. While they're growing up, some people it's a childhood trauma. Some people it's in the relationship. He says here, cast your care upon him, for he cares. So I want to start by defining what a trauma is. Is anyone here? You don't have to signify, but has anyone been through a traumatic experience? You know what I'm talking about? You see, the painful thing about trauma is when it happens, whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it's betrayal, whether it's whatever it is. The Bible teaches us to forgive. So we forgive. And some people struggle with forgiveness. But as we journey, if we don't heal, we would find out that we carry on with life, but we are bleeding on the inside. And the sad reality is, is many people bleed out without even knowing. So maybe somebody has done something that has hurt you. And you're trying, trying to come to terms as to why. Did you know that there is one common question anyone that has been through a traumatic experience asks? Does anybody know? Thank you. Why me? Why me? Why did it have to happen? Because sometimes we feel like having answers to that question would give us some closure. Maybe you're asking why. The Bible tells us all things work together for our good. All things, all things work together for our good. And I'm not standing here today teaching this because I'm detached from it. I've had my own share. And I'm sure many of us here Some may have experienced some sort of trauma or some are actually still going through the trauma. You see, when the Bible says to forgive, sometimes we begin to ask the question, does it mean I absorb the cost? Because for some reason, you want that person to experience the consequence of their action. So by forgiving, you walk away with the pain. You feel as though it's not just. You feel, why should I have to? But let me say something before we go on. When we forgive, which is what the Bible says we should do, this should be our default position. 
It doesn't matter if the person acknowledges they're wrong. It doesn't matter whether they've come to the place where they own up to you. Because they may never. But the Bible teaches to forgive. When we forgive, we need to learn to draw boundaries to protect ourselves. You see, because if you don't draw boundaries, you may fall into the same situation again, over, again, and again. And the Bible teaches to forgive. I told you something the other day. I said that forgiveness may not necessarily change the offender. That you chose to forgive may not necessarily change the offender, but it will surely change you. And this morning, I want to just look at some examples in the Bible. You know, sometimes some things will happen and you begin to question whether or not God is a just God. You know, you ask, I, I didn't bring this upon myself, but it's now my problem to deal with. The story of Joseph comes to bed, Genesis chapter number 37. Let's go there, please. Genesis chapter 37. Some of us may have had a childhood trauma. And we've just covered it up. And we've just accepted that is life. It needs to be dealt with. We need to, with the help of the Holy Spirit, bring it up. And let God help us. Because you see, what trauma does is it affects the way we see. It colors a perspective of life. Just because you've had a bad experience with somebody doesn't necessarily mean everybody will be like that. But if we don't deal with it, heal, we may think everyone is like that. Some of us may have trust issues if it's a betrayal. Does anybody know the last miracle Jesus performed? Anyone? Remember that? The guy, one of the soldiers that came to arrest Jesus. And what did Apostle Peter do? He cut it off. Please hear me out. The last miracle Jesus performed was that of the ear. Who afflicted the pain to the young man? Peter. What position did Peter occupy? A top minister. Jesus said something about him. The rock. Peter was the head of the church, as it were. Am I right? But as the head of the church, Peter traumatized somebody. What did Jesus do? Jesus fixed it, but did not sack Peter. Some of us have been traumatized by even the church. And as a result, we've allowed the ear that was cut off to decay. 
What Jesus did was to put it back so that you can hear God. Once again. Jesus fixed it. Yes, Peter will learn his lesson. And he will still be. He still carried on being what Jesus called him to be. But the young man was healed. And some of us have closed ourselves because of the trauma that we've experienced. And we can't even hear God anymore. Jesus healed that young man. It's not good enough to say, you know, I'm, I'm done with God. I'm done serving God. Because I opened myself to the church and Christians and look at the way I've been betrayed and treated. And in a way, we try to justify our actions. No. Jesus put it back together. And I pray today that it would do the same for as many that are in that situation. Because God wants to speak to you. God is reaching out. We must not allow the event of the past dictate what our future becomes. Like I said, trauma has a way of coloring our perspective of life. So, for example, if it's one of betrayal, you may struggle to trust people. You may never trust people anymore. But you see, it's impossible to walk one with another without trust. So it affects the way you relate to people. As I was pondering on this, I woke up, I was telling my wife, I woke up that morning, yesterday, and the first thing I said, it was like the Lord was speaking to me, coming out of my sleep. And these words came out of my mouth. So I picked up my phone and I wrote it down. Because I believe there are quite a lot of people, believers, that are forgiven but are in pain. And Jesus has come to heal that pain. He's come to restore that individual. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Look at the story of Joseph. Genesis chapter number 37. Let's just go there quickly. Genesis chapter number 37. I want to read from verse 23. We, we know the story, so we're going to skip some parts. It says, So it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped him. I want us to note what happened to him. They stripped him of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. The coat of many colors that his father gave him. The Bible says when the brothers decided to traumatize him, they took it away. They took away his covering. Something that was specific, unique to him. You see what trauma does? It takes it off us. And not only that, look at what they did. Then they took him and cast him into a pit. And the Bible says, and the pit was empty and there was no water in it. Well, he couldn't survive in that place anyway. But the next line is quite instructive. Look at what he says in the next line. He says, and they sat down to eat a meal. 
He said, after doing what they did to their blood brother, they were still able to eat. And on this side of life, you may not understand fully why. But you see, we talk about Joseph and we speak about his story and what happened to him. But did you know that while the man, the young man was in the pit, the brother were eating and enjoying themselves. And three things struck me. Number one, trauma varies from person to person. So how I deal with it, for somebody else, you may try to fight it, you may try to jump out of the pit, you may try to run away. But the Bible is silent about how and what Joseph did. He wasn't dead, but he was in the pit. Number two, not only does it vary, in some most cases, we don't have a choice. Now, Joseph did not choose to be put into that place. And if you've been through a traumatic experience, you didn't have a choice in it. It wasn't like they came to you, oh, would you like me to do this to you? No. And number three, he almost lost his voice because he did not speak. At least the Bible didn't record that he said anything. And some of us, we've lost our voice. We are a shadow of who we used to be because of the pain of the past. Yet the people that put you there are enjoying, feasting, and eating. But because of what they've done, you've lost your voice. You found yourself in a painful place. And sometimes you, thank you, Holy Spirit. Sometimes you can't handle it. With tears rolling down your eyes, you ask the question, why? And we have to forgive. So we forgive. But forgiving doesn't take the pain away. You have to heal from that pain. You know, as I was studying this, I did a bit of research. That there are actually four, you, I mean, people have different takes, but four kinds of trauma. Number one, let me write it out. Number one, acute. And this one is an exposure to a single deeply distressing event. So maybe it's a divorce, maybe a betrayal. It's a single distressing event. And some of us may have experienced that. It might be the death of a loved one. And you're asking the question, why? Number two, a chronic one.
this is an exposure to a deeply distressing event over a period of time. So like a domestic abuse. Maybe in a marriage, a relationship. It's not just one. It's a series. Number three. Complex. I have some medical students here. They are wondering. <laughs> A complex one. This is several prolonged distressing events. It could be child abuse. So you grew up in that environment for maybe 18 years, 15 years, and all you knew uh, are traumatic experiences which has shaped who you are. And there's one last one which I thought might be important to put there. It's a secondary one. And I'll tell you what I mean by that, secondary. And that is a, an exposure to someone that has been traumatized. Do you know what I'm talking about? I know some people, they have a heart of stone. They can't feel anything. But normal people, normal people have a way of, you know, when somebody is going through a pain, you feel that. And so people are traumatized by what others are going through. But you see, we don't talk about this in church. And so what happens? We sweep them under, under the feet. We just sweep them under the carpet. But the Bible says, the Bible tells us, even Jesus was distressed. Book of Matthew chapter 26. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says he was sorrowful. You know, sadly, we, some of us are from a culture where they, they tell even the men not to express themselves. Come on, be a man. Be a man. And a lot of men have been sent to their early graves because of this. You see, when you think about traumas, you, you may question whether or not God is a just God. Because what he tells you to do is to forgive. What he says to you is to forgive. But what happens with the pain? You see, I've been through a few myself, and there are times when I thought, I'm okay. I'm all right. You know, oh, I'm, I'm fine now. But then I realize I'm actually not fine. Until you address it. Let me. This cause the second thing. Because of time. Number two. You see, trauma is the event that has happened 
The second theme is triggers. Does anybody know what triggers are? What are triggers? Something that makes you remember the traumatic experience. You see, emotional wounds, they are now. Let me explain what I mean. If you've been emotionally wounded, and maybe it happened 10 years ago, if you're not healed and you think about it or you're triggered about it, you will feel the pain fresh all over again. As though it just happened. Because emotional wounds, they are now. If you do not heal, So triggers are anything that reminds us of the traumas irrespective of what our current mood is. What I mean by that is this. You may be very happy now and all of a sudden there's a trigger. It changes everything. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You may be in a good place but then the trigger comes and it changes your mood. How do we deal with these triggers? How, how do we come to an understanding? You see, trigger in itself does not break us. It's how we respond to those triggers that matters. Let me give you an example. If you had a bad experience, maybe um, as a child. Seeing other children may not be bad, but it could be a trigger for you. And if you've not healed, it becomes difficult. very difficult to go past it. There are two types of triggers. You've got the, the internal triggers and these ones are the ones that you can't see. So nobody can see them. They are emotional, they are psychological, the mental. You can't see them but you feel them on the inside. But there are external triggers. Maybe you find yourself in an environment amongst maybe some friends, a particular event that brings these triggers. The internal ones you may not be able to explain to people how you feel. But they are there. And what I want us to do today is to understand that whether you've been traumatized or you're going through a traumatic experience, God cares. And his strength is always available. And there are things we may need to do to help us. That's why I said the title is Traumas, Triggers, and the Lord. Because you see, it's not good enough to just talk about the bad experiences and the things that remind us of it without looking at what the Bible says. For some people, it may take a while 
let, let me just cast our mind back to Joseph. Remember that he was in the pit. His brothers were eating outside. Feasting. But the next time he set his eyes on his brothers, God had worked on him. To the point that when he saw them, he said, the Lord sent me here ahead of you. Because for some of us, depending on how deep these things are, we need to let God work in us. Allow the Holy Spirit to come in that area. So that it will change the way we see. I believe if Joseph had seen his brothers maybe three days after he was sold into slavery, I don't think he'll be smiling at them. I don't think so. I don't think he'll be smiling at them and going, oh, you know, don't worry, it's okay. No. I think one by one, he'll be plotting their downfall, one by one. But God had worked on him. God had healed him to the point that he could not repay evil for evil. The Bible says vengeance is the Lord's. It's not for us to repay evil for evil anyway. Let's see what the Lord expects us to do. When we say the third thing is the Lord, what I mean by that is, what is God's perspective of whatever it is we face? How does God expect us to deal with this thing? Number one, give thanks. I'll tell you why. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. From verse number 16, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything, in everything, not in some things, in everything, give thanks. Do you know why? Let me explain what it means to thank God. God. It's not just saying, God, I thank you. I thank you. No. Let me explain what it means. Imagine I had something in my hands. I was carrying maybe a bucket. Right? And I needed to go out of the hall. And I got to the door. But I could not drop the bucket. But I needed to go out. And maybe Sister Rosemary says, Oh, pastor is just about, and she opens the door for me, and I step out. What should I say to her? Thank you. Why do I say thank you? Appreciation. Appreciation. Yes, what else? What else? Thank you, but because I couldn't have done it on my own. So it's an acknowledgement that she has helped me. It's an acknowledgement that I couldn't have done this on my own. So when we thank God, we are actually acknowledging God's help in that situation. Are you catching this? We are not just appreciating, we are acknowledging if not for you, I couldn't have gone through the door. If not for you, I would have been stranded. 
And so the first thing we do is we give thanks. And I know that that experience could have been traumatic. Yet, he says, in all things, give thanks. He says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So the will of God in Jesus for us in every situation, give thanks. Because it shows our dependency on him. Number two, we pray. You see, we have to learn to pray. What many of us do is we complain about the situation. What the Bible tells us to do is to pray. In fact, what many of us do is prayer becomes a last resort. Oh, I've done everything. Oh, I've tried everything. Okay, I'll pray. No. Prayer should be our first action. And when we pray, don't forget we're forgiven. Right? So don't curse them in your prayer. Don't say, Father Lord. Father Lord, I'm innocent. Let your fire. No. We're forgiven. But we pray. We pray that God, by His Spirit, would hold our hands through the journey. It might be step by step. We might even take baby steps. But as we pray, we receive strength. As we pray, the Spirit of God touches our eyes to have the right perspective. For Joseph, I believe it took him that long so that he could see clearly. For Job, he had the same experience. Job was so traumatized, he wished he was dead. The Bible says he cursed the day he was born. Elijah experienced trauma. He wished he was dead. So we need to learn to pray. Whether it's five minutes, whether it's ten minutes, whether it's one hour. Because when we pray, we are letting go and letting God. Number three, we have to submit to the Lord. James chapter number four. Let me show you something there. James chapter four. You know, as I was looking into this, something interesting I found something interesting. I've read this scripture before many times. It says from verse 7, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee. You see, whether it's the trauma or the triggers, what God expects us to do is to submit and you know, the interesting thing, he says, submit to God, but then resist the devil, which means you are not to submit to the devil. Are you catching this? But if we do not submit to God, invariably, we're submitting to the devil. This is why he encourages us to submit to God first. 
Because if I do not submit to God, to the Lordship, then I will submit to the devil. And I know what the devil wants to do anyway. He brings pain. He brings shame. And we keep asking the question, why, why, why? And we allow the past, the event of the past, destroy who we should become. Some of us become angry going forward. Some of us become less trusting of others going forward. And the issues of the past that have not been dealt with will bring it into our future and it destroys everything. This is what the devil does when you submit to him. So we are encouraged to submit to the Lord. He says, when you submit to the Lord, you resist the devil, he will flee. The next one, we need to watch our thoughts. We need to watch our thoughts. Philippians chapter number four. We need to watch our thoughts, what we think about. You see, our thoughts are seeds. And if we are not careful with our thoughts, we will never come out of that situation. Philippians chapter number four. Are we there? I want to read from verse number Philippians chapter four. From verse seven. Let me start from verse 6. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace, the Bible says, we should ponder on these things, whatsoever is pure. Whatsoever is of good report. When you guard your thoughts and not allow the devil bring you to that place where you are triggered, the Bible says the peace of God that surpasses understanding. You can't understand that peace. If you've been through a traumatic experience and you allow this to happen to you, you may not be, you will not be able to understand that peace because you can't explain it. It says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, and it will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Then he says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Tell somebody, watch your thoughts. Tell somebody, watch your thoughts. Because every time we complain, every time we, we try to just think about, oh, how horrible they are. 
we drag ourselves back into that place. But we can resist the devil and say, in the name of Jesus, I refuse to think that way. I meditate on the good things. I meditate on the pure things. Things that are praiseworthy. It says, meditate on these things. The next one is get a mentor. Now, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And I know that. And he helps us. But it's important that you find yourself someone who can help you and take you through objectively it's important objectively not the one that goes ah, okay all right no objectively to walk you through that journey and the last one because of time it helps to develop a new habit You see, maybe you decide to study the Bible even more. Maybe you may decide to pick up a book. For some people, it might just be going to the gym. Do something different. But make this the last Thing. because if you only do this one you are just covering up so you can develop a habit when you begin to sense those things those triggers go for a walk begin to pray begin to talk to God begin to speak in tongues Pick up the Bible and use that time productively for yourself. Because as you do, I may not be able to promise you that those things will go away in two weeks or in two months. But what I can assure you is this. You will not remain where you used to be. Because with the help of God's spirit, you would have moved on to a better place. And you would have changed yourself into becoming a better person. And you would allow the healing process to take place. So as I finish, whether you've been traumatized or maybe you're going through a trauma as we speak, maybe for you, you've been through it already and it's just triggers that you're experiencing. Let us move from those stages Let's move to the Lord. And let the Lord help us that we may heal and be the best version of ourselves. Praise God. Let's talk to God. Let's spend some time to talk to God. Spend some time to talk to God yourself. I said it's a sensitive topic let's talk to God ourselves Father we thank you
We thank you because you are the God of all things. You know all things. You see all things. You know the individual pains that we are facing. We thank you for the workings of the Holy Spirit helping us to find healing. Lord, I pray for those in pain because you are our comforter. I pray they will find comfort in the name of the Lord Jesus. I thank you for the strength, the courage, the power to move away and begin the walk with you. I thank you, Lord, for the wisdom to do it. And Lord, I thank you because in our hearts we would release them as many that we may be holding, O oh God, in our hearts. That you alone will be glorified. That we may find peace and joy. Strength in all things. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God.